So good evening. Um, my name is Christy Vallier, and I am the assistant professor of, I am an assistant professor um, in the architecture program and the chair of this year's Knowlton School Balmer lecture series entitled Doubling. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Neil Denari, an architect, professor, and design star, not his own description. I also just learned today that Neil offered an inaugural lecture in Knowlton Hall approximately 10 years ago, so a very big welcome back. Neil is principal of Neil, De Neil M. Denari Architects and a dedicated professor of architecture at UCLA. He's a committed to the pedagogy of architecture even as his practice continues to grow. He's an engaged designer rigorously pursuing a project at every scale. Whether speculative or real, the projects garner both academic and professional recognition, including a recent AIA Los Angeles gold medal. A notable score is his recent competition win for his first international project, the new Kelyung Harbor Port Terminal and Port Authority Building, slated to be completed in 2019. Along with the numer numerous awards, the projects reside at prominent addresses, such as the MoMA Archive, Wilshire Boulevard, and the High Line in New York City. In fact, HL23, a 40,000 square foot condominium along the High Line, is labeled by his office as if the tower responds to the inquiry how to stand out and fit in at the same time. While this is seemingly referencing the project, I think this statement summarizes many thing, things I have come to appreciate about Neil. From my perspective, he is a no-compromise kind of architect, but also one who understands the rules in order to alter them, and one who works with conviction and ease at the same time. Neil made a strong impression on me as a graduate studio professor. To this day, I don't know too many architects that could roll out a studio brief entitled, Empty Form, No Program, and execute it as he did with productive parameters, critical discussion, and strong results. It provoked many heated reviews, as you can imagine, but most importantly, it asked students of architecture to reach deep as designers, and you had the feeling that Neil was reaching deep, too. The lecture tonight, entitled Reality Distortion Field, Upon hearing that, I immediately, it immediately evoked gyroscopic horizons for me, a monograph published in 1999 that was in, my, was in heavy rotation in my list of reference books, akin to being bookmarked today. I relied on this, as did many in my generation, for conceptual development of ideas, modes of representation, and simply for setting and raising the bar for what is possible. The book, and of course the work as it develops today, defines and illustrates a meticulous sensibility and a devotion to the modification of a datum, in essence, an interest in a new normal. Please help me welcome Neil Denari. Christy, thanks very much. And that was just... Uh, yeah, when you mentioned that, I gave a studio, and now I remember it was no program in texture mapping or something like that. And um, I've always been interested in, in getting students out of the, the usual sort of human tropes of uh, give me the program, give me the site, and then I'm going to go to my sketchbook and start sketching, and then we'll talk. Um, did I ban sketchbooks? I, 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 I don't allow students to show me their sketchbooks. I think I've, I've had that for as long as I've been teaching. You come up and show me the sketchbook, and you go, what do you think about this? You're a trained expert. And I'll go, well, in the hands of Le Corbusier, that sketch is a brilliant project. In your hands, probably it's bad. So sorry to be so blunt. Make a commitment, and then we can kind of talk. Um, how do I, am I just going to, OK. The term reality distortion field, actually, you think you've heard it before and that it's been around for a long, long time, but it, but it was in a term used uh, to describe Steve Jobs, I think, in 1981 by uh, one Bud Tribble who worked with Steve Jobs in, in Apple. And if you know about him and have the stuff, uh, basically, the reality distortion field, as it would be relative to him, was, can we turn the lights down, get a little bit more contrast? 
he goes in and essentially makes his team work harder than they've ever worked before. Sound familiar? Your professor is trying to just get you to, you know, push harder, push harder. You can do it. On the other hand, the distortion field was your idea became Steve Jobs' idea. And if you read the book, you know, there's somebody in there and, hey, Steve, I got a great idea for a small micro uh, uh, unit. It's going to, you know, have thousands of songs on it. And he walks in and goes, that's the worst idea that I've ever seen. One week later, he comes in and goes, I've got a great idea for a small micro device. But Steve, that was my idea. No, it wasn't. It was my idea. So Steve gets the position of, you know, the world's biggest asshole and the, the biggest manipulator of people and then somehow inspirational genius at the same time. Sounds like an architect, <laughs> right? We're trying, we're, we're constantly trying to, to, to convince you uh, in a particular culture. I, I show up to try and be persuasive. It might be like a court of law. I want you to leave thinking what I said was somehow factual or purposeful or specific or it hit the mark or it made sense. But really all I'm offering in the same way that Steve Jobs is, is I'm offering a series of conditions that essentially look at what reality is and what we're trying to do with design, which if you think about certain authentic approaches to architecture, somebody might say, I'm holding up a mirror to the world. You know, the world is messed up and complicated and it's full of angst and energy. And if you think that I'm going to make work that's like a panacea to that or that's going to solve it, architecture can't do it. All I'm going to do is hold a mirror up and make it the most authentic project because this is the world we live in. And when the world changes, then I'm still going to hold the mirror up and my design project will, will, will reflect that. Some people might call it, well, that's designing for the zeitgeist. But do you think Mies held a mirror up to the world? There, his project wasn't holding a mirror up to the world, even though he argued that it was of its time. This is a project we did in, in uh, first, first built project, 1996, an installation in, in, uh, in, in Tokyo. This came uh, at the a time when, on the one hand, after 10, 15 years of drawing kind of Baroque technology in ink and mylar and, and having had computers kind of enter the office in the early 90s, this was a project in which we tried, and I think others, because this falls into the single surface project, but I think ours is a particular brand of it, where uh, the proposition somehow had to become, uh, I want to say, a, um, a, a political project. And so what we saw at the time was technology becoming a uh, univocal uh, proposition, whether it was IBM selling you something or Motorola selling you a chip or Steve Jobs selling you something. Um, technology allows you to access the world and landforms don't mean anything. So the sort of uh, world that we know in architecture and terra firma got slipped out from underneath us. Somehow we became connected to whether it was an electronic paradigm or something else. So I had to make a kind of a graphic architectural conceptual leap to say if the world you know becomes still about place and territory it's not about uh, specificity of uh, region or location and that was a political statement and people still make those kind of political statements today so I looked at this homolocene projection it was an unfolded surface obviously of something that was round and deep and there are many many types of projections that were developed, all of which deal in distortion at some level. And I chose the homolocene because it distorted the landforms the least. If you look at Mercator projections or, or Bucky Fuller projections, there's all kinds of quote unquote distortions going on. And I suppose if you cut that out and glued it all together, you might get a sort of a loosely kind of lumpy sphere. But in reality, what was going on was Land didn't mean anything anymore, and the very thing that architecture is sort of based on, which is site, and which is a terra firma, and place, and location, all kinds of things that other architects, let's say like Steve Hall or, or um, uh, Peter Zumthor, really made cases for, I was looking at uh, uh, the idea that the world was one big field, and it was a univocal field, and our project was to develop a design that would respond to the generic, 
And in a way, the Gallery Ma project what was like a new primitive, but it wasn't a primitive like a Lego block primitive, like let's say a Dutch architecture might have. This was, all it is was a surface, and it depended on how you cut it out and wrapped it and put it into a place that it became uh, uh, meaningful. So here's a project we did a few years uh, later, um, a large uh, office building uh, interior in, in uh, Beverly Hills. Um, and we were using these um, techniques spatially, not with the same sort of specific motivation that we did in this kind of narrative of a kind of post-technology, post-political, uh, univocal sort of world. But you could see that we developed something that it actually became relatively specific at the same time. And we weren't interested in making a generic uh, primitive to make generic architecture. We tried to do it in a way to become specific. But this was our way of distorting what we saw as the bigger, unknowable, unfathomable world into something that was a new reality, obviously, superimposed on the one that we know. Now, this is a project, I think, by Graft uh, in Berlin. I think it happened about a year after the project you just saw. So what we had helped develop, in fact, was a generic uh, proposition, just uh, developable surfaces, uh, flat surfaces, conic uh, projections, and so forth. And you could make an office in Beverly Hills. You could paint it red and make a uh, bar in uh, Berlin. So there was some curiosity uh, about the reality that this uh, proposal we had about making uh, a, a new distorted map, so to speak, could be utilized in a very, very open way. This is not a presentation of uh, we did it first or we did it better. Uh, here's a, an unbuilt project. I believe this is 1998 for a big uh, uh, idea about um, uh, um, mass and density within a particular kind of California climate and within this system of repeating, uh, as you see, color-coded um, shaped uh, bands of space. All we're doing is sort of drawing a profile similar uh, to what we did in Tokyo, extruding it, and then bundling it together like a series of uh, uh, cross sections like snowflakes. They're all the same and they're all different. And uh, we, you know, we learned a lot about how to essentially apply this to a project that could be considered to be quite normative. Now this is Bentham Crowell uh, 13 or 14 years later. This is a project uh, they recently completed in, in, in Holland. Very good friends of mine, actually. Uh, uh, Dutch architects, and um, <clears throat> you know, when you look at a project like this, where uh, it's really a, a mat building and a tower, similar to, let's say, Lever House, but in this case, using a, an opaque skin that's got perforations in it and a kind of infill system that, in its own kind of form of economy, we help develop that. This uh, uh, project of, of, of the surface. Uh, seems to have uh, life to it, and it's not a question, again, of ownership. It's that the origin of this came from this represents the world. That's where it came from, from us. It represents the world, and in a way, it was, if it represents the world, then it can be used anywhere in the world, and then it just becomes locally kind of configured, in this case, to, 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 to make an office building in, 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 in Amsterdam. Uh, Jean-Luc Godard um, made a film in 1965 called Pierre Le Fou. It was in the middle of his most radical, well-known period of, of filmmaking from 1959 to 1967 when he made narrative uh, films. But his whole ambition during that time was to kill the Hollywood movie. He started out um, with uh, the jump cut project of uh, uh, Breathless. We're going to kill narrative. We're going to kill continuity. Uh, we're going to break the fourth wall. Actors are going to stare into the camera and say things and uh, use Brechtian techniques to, to get out of the fantasy of storytelling to really kind of make it clear. You're in a theater watching a movie. You're not living the fantasy of what's really going on in there. And a critic asked him in, uh, about this movie. There's a certain amount of violence in it, but if you've seen these films, it's not like it's akin to a slasher movie or something. And a critic said, why is there so much blood in Pierre Le Fou? And he goes, oh, uh, it's not blood, it's just red. And uh, what do you mean? 
No, it's just red. I mean, look at this. This is uh, an image of Anna Karina. They go probably, uh, you know, a person goes and drips some red liquid. Doesn't even look like she's hurt. Looks like somebody dripped, you know, red paint. And here, even in this incredible close-up. So he's obviously taking the reality of violence, of which we also associate very much with uh, uh, graphicism, because the two main graphic worlds that we know are sex and violence, terms that, in fact, you, you apply to, to articulate intensity. If we're going to talk about graphic architecture, it's pretty weird. It usually means thin and opaque and with no substance and with no ability to shock or scare. But when you talk about graphic sex, you got images in your head, right? Or graphic violence, there are serious images in your head. And I want to uh, uh, conflate a little bit of that. So he says it's not blood, it's red. He's signifying uh, 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 violence at one particular level. As if, if I said, here's a building, it's, it's made out of aluminum and silver. And, I, and you say, it's a spaceship. And I go, it's not a spaceship, it's just silver. This doesn't send a message necessarily about that unless you uh, uh, make it um, connect to that. So here tonight, design is red. The, 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 the issue of design as an already pushing uh, what a new reality would be, um, that's what you do. Where there is no building and now there is one, you've completely twisted uh, uh, reality around, not just shape to context. Material life is blood. Um, and when you put these together, then you get a kind of graphic realism. I used to, uh, Ernan uh, lectured here not long, two weeks ago or something. And um, I always walk up to Ernan and go, Ernan, you're interested in red and I'm interested in blood because I'm a really super concrete person and you're a storyteller with images. And, you know, just like Godard, when he said cinema is the truth 24 times a second, I changed my mind as he did because he says 24 times a second uh, film is a lie. And you just decide what's truth and what's a lie. And the reason why I changed my mind is because uh, I, I'm a super concrete person. And so, you know, blood, blood is the real stuff. And red is smoke and mirrors and, 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 and trickery. But I think Ernan uses blood. And I use blood. And Ernan uses red. And I use red. I mean, almost literally, to the point where it doesn't matter what he builds or doesn't build or what I build, and that shows somehow a commitment to the concrete. I just changed my mind about what the concrete is, and the concrete isn't, isn't just the world that we construct, and I'll explain why we have to think that images are as concrete as anything. Street photography, and I'm going to talk about photography, and the whole lecture goes through the process of photography because every image that you see, whether we went out and snapped a picture with a camera or we made a rendering, you're going to look at it in uh, the filter of photography. Street photography, um, here's a guy and a dog in New York City. It's a spectacular moment, obviously sort of in the Cartier-Bresson uh, decisive moment. A photographer runs around the streets, fires away, goes home and sees what he gets. Jeff Wall, who's been doing this stuff since the late 70s, is not a street photographer. He, he operates off of a deceptive relation to street photography. This one's called Milk. Perfectly composed, uh, cameras, uh, uh, two uh, point, uh, one point perspective to the bricks, nothing is, is uh, distorted. He hires an actor, and if you know Jeff Wall's stuff, sometimes he goes out for three weeks, four weeks, a month, practices like literally a, a, a filmmaker just to get you know one image because the image is a kind of big sublime thing, worth a lot of money and so forth. Did he ask the guy to shake the milk different ways? Probably. Uh, to a certain extent, he's like a street photographer, hoping he gets maybe a certain shape of milk spill uh, to design it in that way. So in this sense, this is also blood, and it's also uh, uh, just red. It's blood in the sense that it's a real photograph of a real guy sitting there giving you the impression that an event happened, but it's also just red because it's not real. And the relationship between the concrete and uh, uh, the invented or the artifice is, is, it's all about not only what we do, but I would say that's what architects do in general. This is the Sanchez brothers. So 
you look at that image and depends on your kind of level of receptivity of photography and whether or not you'd look at that and go, wow, that's a real image, you know, photojournalism, that's a, that's a, 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 a street photography beyond belief. But you know that a guy walking around with a camera in New York might come across a guy swinging a dog. Maybe he comes across that once in six months. But he's not going to come across walking the street and a bomb goes off in lower Manhattan. Never will happen. Um, yet the composition of the piece, the artifice of it, uh, they're trying to get out of the way, but they're really uh, uh, almost look like they're just like a bird's flying and pooping on them or something. Oh, uh, you know, nothing really as intense as a bomb going off. This is called Box and Stop by Andreas Gursky, uh, made up of hundreds and hundreds of uh, four by five uh, shots. Um, built up in a way in which you're not even sure, you know, is it a rendering, is it a painting, is it a pure Photoshop? You know, obviously you can't imagine that being totally derived out of parts and pieces of, of uh, uh, found material, yet the construction of it, uh, and we know, it, it, it presents itself as altogether real. You can study where everybody's looking. Uh, Two teams that close uh, probably never happens, you know, in a Formula One race that's too chaotic. Yet there it is. It's like this Jacques Louis David piece where we also know that, you know, painting has been a, a long time uh, uh, mission to also, you know, create allegories and capture uh, scenes and so forth. But you also know that Jacques Louis da David is in a studio someplace not in a field, making it up. This is uh, um, a Swiss uh, artist. Uh, this image is also made up of, of hundreds of photographs. And this is not a, um, a unique uh, world. There are lots of uh, uh, photographers building up uh, scenography, just like a studio painter like David. Um, the two trees leaning into one another, they don't exist like that in space. It's completely uh, composed. It's real and it's real blood to the extent that you won't be able to see any seams in the way in which the pieces go together. But of course, it's a story being told about that life. Now, what you might find shocking is uh, this is uh, Tim Harmon. You don't know him. He's a student of mine. And this is what we're uh, doing in research studio. I've, I've compelled my students to design uh, fictitious landscapes and render them to, the, to an inch of their life. These are just stand-in uh, frames. Uh, we're going to be designing essentially super exotic, very, very specific frames made out of uh, steel and carbon fiber with every uh, uh, fastener put together, all the texture map of the carbon fiber. We're going to stuff it with trees. And these are just practice shots because I thought, I want to work like these photographers, but uh, I got to work in a kind of seamless way so that red and blood uh, mix together. So this is an interesting example. This is a really dumb one. This was like the first, uh, first couple of weeks. They had to figure out actually how to do the renderings. These are in 3D Max, uh, which mostly they were using uh, Rhino and V-Ray. And uh, they relate to something like this. Gregory Crutzen, another uh, uh, artist working within the realm of uh, allegory and, and photography, just like Jeff Wall, um, different sorts of storytellings, different sorts of uh, uh, cultures and images may be uh, more tending toward um, rural south and kind of distressed uh, uh, white trash landscapes and so forth. You look at the image and it doesn't make any sense. Whoever was in that car is probably dead. She walks up, probably didn't get out of the car, is maybe going to just take the found suitcase, go someplace with it. But all the messages that, you're av that are available in this image in terms of content are sent through the simultaneous ludicrousness of the scene with the quote unquote believability that it's a seamless image taken by you know, a photographer with a, with a field camera. Uh, same thing here. And while these pieces are completely set up, a photographer is writing a program, just like somebody's giving you three bedrooms and two baths. He's writing a program and says, here's what we're going to do with this piece. It's going to be set into 
uh, let's say in this case, you know, uh, suburban uh, reality. But these are very, very obvious uh, uh, reality distortion field pieces. This is another one uh, uh, by one of my students. He took the monolith from 2001 and has this uh, deer staring into it. And uh, I hate the moon. I told him to get rid of the moon. The moon shouldn't be there. But uh, um, the blue light coming from nowhere, of course, you see it relative to the same type of lighting conditions that uh, Gregory Crudson or Jeff Wall sets up. There's a big crew out there. They've got blue lights there. You, you know it's just like a, a, a Hollywood movie. And we actually want to endeavor to make things like that completely invented out of, out of uh, our own imaginations. And I don't know any other studio that's doing this. I don't know any other architect who's compelling their students to sort of operate in this world so that the photographic becomes uh, a shocking, challenging kind of thing as opposed to letting student work be student work because uh, you're beginners. In, in a way, I don't care about students being where they are. I want them to become experts, especially in this particular medium. So tonight, the law of identity, if the real equals graphic, and the graphic equals vivid, then the vivid equals real. That's an airtight you know, argument, at least for the next 45 minutes. Now, the other curious thing is we build 15% of all the projects that come into the office, whether they're competitions or whether they're proposals or whether they're long conversations, we build 15%. Architects build between 10 and 30%. Norman Foster does 30%, the ultimate 300 hitter, Hall of Fame hitter, and uh, we're doing okay at 15%. What about the other 85%? What about it? You send it out in the world, there it is. It, it, maybe it contributes to a conversation or not. But that's 85% of, of, of my and my team's blood, sweat, and tears. If we can't already just tell ourselves it's as real as the stuff that you can go knock on, then it's a pretty sad you know, sort of project. So some of this has to do with the fact that everything that we make, including 85%, which lives in the world of images, if we can't make a compelling argument for the life of those images, as opposed to just making some sloppy renderings of an idea and going, yeah, it's an idea, it's okay, it doesn't have to be that tight because, you know, it's just not going to get built. We don't believe in that, and that's because I'm the most concrete architect there is. Okay, I'm going to show you a few projects. Um, we got a commission in uh, Pacific Palisades from uh, West Side liberal uh, uh, progressive family of four, two kids, two boys, uh, mom and a dad, they're into sports, and they said, we don't want a glass house, you know, like the famous uh, uh, Pierre Koenig stuff. Um, we don't want to live in a prison either, but we want to feel some sense of privacy and security. You know, they're wealthy, they live in the, uh, they're in the entertainment industry and so forth. So we figured we had to split the difference between, uh, you know, these two projects. And I'm not going to show you all the process. What I want to show you, in, not only in this project, but all the projects, these are renderings. I want you to think about them as photographs. I'm not, uh, I'm not tricking you to think they're real photographs, but I want you to think about them as photographs because who does, who's, who does renderings? Uh, who knows how to do a rendering, right? You know how to do it. And there's a camera, right? And then you choose the camera, and then you choose a place to put the camera, right? And then you have lighting and all of that. Would you say that that's similar to what a photographer does? Would you say that it's exactly what a photographer does? Yes. Okay. So you guys are basically photographers and don't know it. And when you make a rendering, and, and I'm doing this for dramatic effect. Of course, I'm not criticizing I mean, in, any of this. But when you make a rendering, you are doing a cell phone shot, not a, uh, a field camera. I've thought about exactly where it's going to be and what it's going to say and what kind of profile. So when I show you these images, you think that we're like a, uh, a, um, a new topographics photographer. We've got an 8x10 camera sitting there. We've made it exactly uh, uh, all the choices about the lens and, and the time of day and everything and, and the level of perfection and so forth that, of course, you can get in an image. So I want you to look at all of those, and I want you to look at the photographs of the built stuff. I think I've got some in there. 
They just embody it in the same way. So this is one seamless world where it's all 100% real. This, this falls into the 85% of stuff that never saw the light of day, but it actually is seeing the light of day right now. Uh, uh, that's a fact, uh, I would argue. Three-story house, it started out 5,000 square feet. On a, you know, a normal site, I said, you're a west side liberal and uh, you love the environment and the, you contribute to all the right politics. Uh, uh, we worked on that and then for about six or eight months and I finally talked them down to a house uh, of 2,600 feet. So that's the big uh, contribution to sustainability uh, in the project. At least that's the first one, make a small uh, footprint. Three stories, bringing back ideas about compression of space, living in Japan, uh, 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 you only need a room if you're gonna use it, otherwise it becomes a kind of an excessive thing. But you can already see what's going on in terms of um, the project. It's an eroded box, uh, a 30 foot tall box, that's how big we can make a, a, a house typically in Los Angeles. Uh, there's an L-shaped leftover site, uh, in this case there are no trees. We're like uh, uh, doing a, a, a Japanese garden where we're annexing all of the other fancy gardens because they actually wanted uh, a, a playing field, um, a place where sh uh, the mom who's a triathlete can ride her bicycle and the kids can swim and so forth. Simple project. Uh, we call it the No Mass House Project um, because you saw the image uh, where the impression of the house as being a rather dense, thick, heavy project, probably more like the, 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 the Lowe's project than, you know, the stall house. Uh, and I'll explain why we want to uh, argue that it's not a project about mass. There's a little bit of poche in there where the, where the steel is, is enclosed because the project wasn't about the rhetoric of exposing um, steel. Here it is looking back on the first floor. You see the kind of accoutrement of uh, everyday life and uh, uh, the scale of the project uh, and what we're trying to do. And th this is the south elevation. You can see that the black uh, surface represents the white plaster and we've tried to erode as much of the white plaster box as possible with windows. So the two windows, of course, are the bigger virtual window which erodes the, 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 the outer surface and then the shaped window which in themselves are still fairly large. So our game was rhetorically, it's just a series of isolated uh, figures except for one window that goes around the corner that I'll show you and then a project about uh, the whizzy widge, uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, here's a detail of that um, uh, south elevation. This is a view on the second floor. It's an open kind of transitional space, you go up uh, on the right into the parents' bedroom, on the left uh, the stairs go up to the two boys, there's the rest of the life uh, going on and you can also see the way in which the windows and the floor plate are all uh, uh, essentially projected into the interior um, and we figured out through some help with our Japanese uh, architect friends who know how to build uh, very, very thin walls uh, about how to make a wall system that would work for this uh, expression uh, of the window. Here's the one window at the bottom. It's the California uh, corner glass uh, window on the ground floor that allows the dining room to connect to the exterior space, but meanwhile it, it migrates up into uh, a closed figure as well, so you see that. So that's one uh, sort of strange uh, uh, but functional iteration of how the, the, the windows uh, work. That's the parents looking out to the east, you can see the, the Getty Center um, <clears throat> across this uh, valley. Now we went pretty far in the project and we were working with uh, structural engineers and you know we were working on, on uh, uh, structural models. It's a, I told you it was a 5,000 square foot house and then we talked them down to 2,600 feet, right? And I said, so you need to be green but you can't reduce the budget. So. We, we were making a very expensive house and we could do that with the budget that they had. Um, now these images, of course, continue the line of, of representation that uh, this project has its own life. No, it didn't get built. We can't go walk out and see it and, and be affected by it. But in terms of being in the room, in terms of architectural culture, we take it all 
sort of seamlessly and, and very, very uh, uh, serious. This is as concrete as, as we could possibly be with the project. Now you see the, the surveyor on the, on the right there? That's, um <coughs> you know, that's part of our little game where we make sure that the scale is perfect, uh, the geometry is perfect, but he's, he's going to fall into the swimming pool. Uh, these are the kind of telltale signs, uh, like a Gregory Crutzen image or a Jeff Wall image, that we are going to kind of plug in to be able to allow you to recognize that as a fictitious moment within the fact that otherwise there's the steel, it was sized, it was uh, uh, calculated, it is a fact and that's what it is and that's what it would be and we put the camera in the site and we make no smoke screen on top of it. So everything relates to this idea of concreteness but you've got to admit this is a reality to distortion field either through the image itself or the projection of the possibility of the house being there, especially in relation to the Italianate villas that would, you know, be its next door neighbors. This is a project we're working on. That one's unfortunately not going to get built because uh, uh, of divorce. They didn't divorce because of the house. It was, it was uh, yeah, I just say they didn't, they didn't really love each other that much. Um, they were actually hoping the house would, would, would uh, save uh, them because they were both passionate uh, on the one hand about the project. This is on Wilshire Boulevard. This is a project of 32,000 uh, feet. Um, it's a 2FAR uh, site. Nothing very uh, sexy about that. Uh, client says, just go make an icon. Make an icon out of a, out of a spec office building. Yes, that's your job. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about icons and what they are and what they mean to uh, forms of reality and expectation. So it's a modest project. Here's our site. Uh, the site is the two lower buildings uh, you see in the left-hand side of Wilshire Boulevard and this kind of uh, flora and fauna of uh, architecture from the 60s through the 90s. Here's like an 80s flush stone banded uh, building on the right-hand side. That's our direct neighbor. There's punched facades. There's double layered 90s facades. There's panelized 60s facades and so forth. And you're thinking, all I can do is work on what a window is because that's what uh, a, a generic uh, office building is. And we do everything that we can to find ways to manipulate uh, the surface, uh, in this case doing all kinds of strange things to be able to get three feet of depth uh, that doesn't go beyond the, the sight line that still builds the maximum number of uh, square feet. And in this case, uh, we have to do that because, uh, is there a laser pointer? No, okay. But you can see the, the, the oh, hey Rob. <laughs> you were secretly shooting it at me, weren't you? Right. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Okay. What do you, do you just carry this around and? <laughs> you! come into my office, right, something like that. So here's a horizontal window, here's a uh, punched window, and we're just blending the horizontal window and the punched window, trying to trick that with uh, white spandrel glass as opposed to sloping stainless steel uh, and, and uh, uh, local cantilevers and so forth. So even, I show you this project, it's, it's, it's uh, not a you know, dramatic story to the project. You're just given a, a commission and, and, and somebody says try to, um, you know, make something that will work in a, you know, in a marketplace and so forth. Now, a term I didn't use uh, um, yet, but I talked about the mirror. Uh, Jean Baudrillard's written about the mirror production, uh, the idea of the mirror of the world and being a, an architect who just gets out of the way and doesn't try to be an author and says, all I need to do is, is build what's out there and, and, and build what you see and build what I see. And in a way, it's almost saying, I don't really see anything. The mirror sees everything, and that's all I'm going to give the world back, essentially taking out uh, the project of uh, you know, the editorial. Our work is funhouse mirror being held up to the world and then essentially making a reality of that reflection in a way. We know that if, if, if 
you want to build something, you must be incredibly concrete. You can't be a smoke and mirrors person, even for a little bit. And I enjoy being very concrete. Yet this is a funhouse mirror project, almost literally. You know, these windows in their kind of odd uh, bulging would almost represent what a body would look like when you projected uh, itself into a funhouse mirror. So these are two big windows, one flush uh, window and two uh, deeply uh, uh, three-dimensional windows that, that find ways to use in our kind of very limited lexicon of developable surfaces, ways in which they can uh, uh, kind of conspire to a certain type of um, expression. <clears throat> this is a competition that we did uh, in 2012 in the summer. Uh, we were invited by Morphosis to be on a team to do the new Chinese University of Hong Kong in Shenzhen. Uh, big uh, open uh, site. Uh, urban edge, uh, big three-dimensional uh, green uh, landscape. Tom did the master plan, <clears throat> and you can see very clearly what's going on. Uh, hard edge buildings here, the circuitous uh, pathway in the middle, and typologies that he assigned through these kind of wiggly slab buildings that uh, meander back up into the landscape. Um, four buildings, this is Tom Wiscombe doing the sports hall. This is our office doing the uh, student union, Morphosis uh, library. Uh, this is our theater, and these were called icon buildings. And uh, Griffin Enright's project is here, Jacques McFarland uh, here, Scoggin and Elam uh, here. And so it was a team of six people. We came in second. And I thought that the master plan uh, worked in a way to be able to let's say, put a set of diverse architects together who, on the one hand, were finding ways uh, to deal with um, <clears throat> repetitive uh, program, let's say, like uh, laboratory buildings, but uh, uh, Brendan getting into, you know, spherical uh, booleans and, and Tom making a, an icon building in the middle. And I'm going to show you uh, this project. Now, we designed this project uh, curiously in these icon buildings, we were only given a point. All the other architects were given typologies, like low buildings against the street or a wiggly slab building that goes up into the landscape. And all we were given was a point, which meant that the project had to relate to kind of omnidirectional uh, uh, um, forms of view and orientation and so forth. The uh, six meter sort of uh, uh, band of canteen and, and program was set, and we had to figure out how to connect that to uh, that world below and then levitate this thing uh, sort of up above. So it's a project on the one hand that is uh, attempting to be very much uh, about its place, yet this is a master plan, completely fabricated, totally uh, uh, of its own design. So we're already dealing with Tom's master plan, which was a piece of fiction that hadn't yet become uh, real, and responding to that as a kind of uh, site in a way. And students would be passing behind it, in front of it, up through it, uh, looking up to the uh, landscape, uh, looking back out at uh, the entrance to the uh, uh, campus by Tom, uh, Tom's building. So we had this uh, project that started out as a, as a simple uh, octagonal form. And by the time we finish operating on it with these uh, uh, very, very simple uh, uh, geometries, a kind of cascading central space with a series of stairs that uh, work fairly, fairly straightforwardly in section, but you can see the, the relation of the uh, perimeter of the project. Double skin uh, 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 project, uh, glass, uh, glass building behind and exposing, uh, you know, with these windows. The, the images themselves, uh, and these images were actually finished after the competition. We came in second, I believe. And so we endeavor to make these images. We, we want to publish them. They'll be a part of the big book. But if we don't make them in this particular way, then maybe they don't have the kind of life we want because this is also part of the 85%. And, and trust me, I can't say it enough. 85% of your blood, sweat, and tears it should, it should do something in the world. It should be coercive. It should contribute to a conversation. 
And in our case, it has to contribute to a heavy level of concreteness. So this isn't a photorealistic image, but I'm pretty sure you'd look at it and go, that's got an incredibly persuasive level of concreteness, and I'd like for you to think that this is maybe the only building that could be done on this particular site. That's the sort of uh, Steve Jobs level of, um, you know, only this. This is the way in which it works. The reality of reflection. Uh, I know some of you are doing this Keelung project and you know the site. For others, uh, this was an international competition in 2012. One of an assembly of uh, projects in, in Taiwan that have been going on since 2005 or six. most of them won by people like Ito and OMA and so forth, and we entered a um, couple of those and didn't get anywhere, and we were able to uh, succeed in winning this one. It's a 350,000 uh, person city, not an Asian tiger, you know, spectacle city like Shanghai or something. This is really a small a uh, town that wants to find its new identity. It's a little bit dilapidated. Um, Japanese uh, came in and built a lot of this uh, housing and uh, office buildings and so forth from, from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And they asked for, of course, an icon project which would put the city on the map, become part of this international network of um, uh, tourism and so forth. Now this is an image of the, of the scheme, uh, that one, and I'm going to show you after this the, the, the scheme as it is, uh, as it will get built. Uh, terminal, um, it's a big uh, horizontal machine. It's the sort of low building, even though in this particular case it's still, you know, six, seven stories tall. Uh, an office building of 550,000 feet and a uh, restaurant which wasn't, uh, none of these were necessarily demanding uh, the specific resolution that we gave them, except that the terminal could only be built in this uh, band and everything else had to be built beyond. So these three pieces sort of took up their place and there was a, a, a responsiveness to the site that we couldn't obviously avoid. So the reality that we had to deal with is something that, uh, there's a little bit of a mirror that we held up this goes here, this goes here. But how do you make an icon out of an office building? That was really a bizarre thing. We want a St. Louis arch. We want a, uh, um, a, a Sydney Opera House. Well, those are arches and, and theaters, and we have a giant office building and a, and a terminal that in many ways uh, don't necessarily go together as being uh, uh, capable of, of being the icon of the city. Um, but we took that on and essentially made a project that is what we hope is a kind of an accumulation of, of uh, quirky, very local kinds of things, uh, you know, to make a project um, not only uh, concrete, but something that's completely twisted the, uh, uh, the way in which uh, the end of the harbor would work. This is the project as it is today and, and how it will be built. Um, a lot of the program was uh, taken out of this uh, terminal. At first, we thought it operated like an airport where there's shopping concourses and lobbies and, and all kinds of diversions. But if you think about it, uh, if there's a big giant ship sitting here with a room and they're already serving drinks, it's more like a hotel. You just want to get through this building and get onto the ship and then uh, uh, the sort of fun begins. The project is really, in that sense, a machine, uh, both literal in terms of uh, HVAC and the whole rise of the building here is about enclosing uh, uh, a huge amount of uh, technology. The levitation of the uh, uh, restaurant, which demands uh, a moment of verticality that the program did not, and we sort of thought that maybe the only way in which we were going to win with these kind of elements that were really a disadvantage to us. Uh, an office building, that we probably have to hold up a mirror to the world a little bit more flat about what is an icon. And so in a funny way, this project tries to assemble a whole series of things that might be normative and also odd and kind of a bundle of quirky uh, moves. And the sum total is sort of what you get. And I'm not sure that it's the most beautiful project we've ever done, but I also appreciate uh, the fact that it's, I think, probably the smartest project we've ever done. Here's the 
uh, terminal, a very, very big uh, hall where 3,000 people have to get through a couple of doors. It's not like an airport where thousands of people are going through lots of doors uh, in our office building sitting um, behind. This is uh, what it is. It's a simple project, and forgive me for being a little bit more sort of just didactic and descriptive. Boats pull up, all of these overhead doors uh, get thrown open, all the bags are just taken into this hall. This is the boarding corridor, and uh <coughs> this essentially is a kind of uh, public space, uh, and that's it uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the terminal. A boardwalk is going to continue down uh, the entire harbor, so the design of this actually becomes the prototype for everything else. There's a whole series of itineraries, both moving through the building and also in and around and underneath this office building, which is a giant, uh, odd, uh, prismatic uh, courtyard project. And these are process shots of, uh, 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 that we do in the office. This is uh, looking into the main hall and some of the um, uh, specific things we're doing with shaping the perimeter of the building does have to do with uh, sending signals and messages, especially in a wet climate, um, using a color like chartreuse allows uh, a certain amount of vividness to happen uh, at night. This is the lower floor. It's a total uh, 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 straightforward uh, uh, machine. That's, that's uh, this uh, particular level, as I said. So you come in on the second floor, go down escalators, pick up your bags, and obviously move out. That's uh, just incredibly straightforward. Uh, uh. Now the uh, project, once we look at the larger pieces that have their own life in a way, this is a kind of uh, uh, assembly of, of elements that have their own specific project based on certain dimensions, based on ambitions toward telling stories uh, uh, about the project of the icon, or using uh, extant ideas about continuous surfaces that continue to persist in wanting to make a, a garden somehow lock itself in to a horizontal roof or a surface that wants to hook the horizontal into the vertical. And we study these things uh, uh, incredibly closely, including the way in which the grain of the roof is falling and shedding water, but of course this has to be a very, very specific type of graphic project. And um, stripes have been a, a big, a big uh, form of meditation in, in, in the studio. And fancy signs and uh, nicely uh, detailed storefront, and here's some interior shots. Um, you know, the, the I have to say, we, we endured a moment where once the client was taking out sort of the spectacle of uh, vast atriums and so forth, you know, there was a certain moment where he said, oh, it's getting worse. You know, they're just making it worse. And in reality, uh, the project that we designed wasn't a real project. It responded to the program, but the program wasn't the real program. So in a way, this project is the thing that has the capacity to distort reality because this is uh, 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 not the fantasy. So it's one big hall, 3,000 people have to queue up here. It's not like a, 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 an airport. There are 95 stations and then you get your ticket and you move through uh, uh, customs and so forth. It's a stratified project. You saw the floor below. This is the main public space. This is a third floor of uh, meeting rooms and uh, some shopping. And you can kind of see the things that we're doing on a very, very local level, which of course are scalable. We only work with uh, um, uh, developable surfaces. We just work with conic surfaces, cylindrical surfaces, flat surfaces, and how they can be economically you know, played out and one of the little tropes that we do is we always uh, take the cone to a point rather than trimming at the top where we'd have a radius as well. And that just simply allows us to go from radial conditions to gridded conditions with found platonic geometry. And, and these kinds of economies, to me, allow that level of buildability and, and reality play out in a way that especially the fall off of light and the way in which phenomenological aspects of these surfaces work, I still say this is more a funhouse mirror being held up to the world than, than any kind of uh, uh, normative one. 
The office building is a, is a courtyard, but it's a bizarre courtyard project, like a kind of Rodin sculpture. Arms are cut off and legs are cut off, and it's a figure that's got its certain uh, references to the human body, not this case, but the Rodin stuff, but it's always too big, maybe a little too grotesque and so forth. And you can see we're, we're, we're exploring very specific ways in which we use conic transitions versus uh, uh, gridded transitions including also the way in which the windows, which are obviously sloped in elevation, not because of any demand, but because we want to defamiliarize this building uh, as far as we can. The landscape below is a, is a shopping center, and you can see all of these itineraries that allow uh, movement through and around uh, uh, this project. This would be the culmination of a big uh, uh, world in this uh, harbor for tourists uh, going to the restaurant, obviously for people moving through in, in the infrastructure of the terminal as well as people just uh, meandering through the gardens. The color, as I mentioned, uh, we use uh, chartreuse. Uh, I obstinately use this material from the mid-80s when I was uh, putting Pantone on, on, on drawings. And then finally realized after doing more research that knowing that chartreuse is the brightest color in the spectrum uh, in the least amount of light. So if you put red, orange, and chartreuse in uh, and looked at it in darkness, the other two would turn black and chartreuse would remain uh, rather vivid. And that was a moment in which, of course, uh, that was one of the more Steve Jobs moment I had in the, in the, in the presentation, which is you will take this building the way it is because I want it this way, uh, but I'm also going to give you a scientific explanation, which is true, but also completely in the service of my own fetish, to be able to make this project have a kind of vivid uh, life to it. And here you see some other ways in which those colors are interacting. This is the interior of the courtyard, uh, all kinds of pathways and itineraries. It's a massive project. Uh, um, and. Uh, Projects of this scale, to me, are always the same as projects of a smaller uh, scale. We have no problem essentially scaling, replicating, or pushing things that uh, uh, relate to human scale to things that relate basically to kind of urban megaforms. Now, I talked about stripes. This is a, a still from Breathless, Abu Tasufla, 1959. And if you go back and look at all those movies from the 1960s, every character is wearing stripes in, in, in his movies. And um, stripes are vivid. Stripes look good with blood on them. Stripes look good in a, a, a bathrobe. This is uh, what's going on in our project. We want all these stripes to kind of crash into one another because we want to make these large surfaces coherent and incoherent at the same time. So when you look at the relationship between a continuous piece of material that when it's folded has a kind of um, offset or a little slice of, of uh, white here, it's coherent, it's just one thing, but the way in which all the parts and pieces patch together, this is really what we're looking at. David Bowie from the Ziggy Sardoff tour et cetera, et cetera. These windows go across two floors, so they disguise uh, the height of the building. They're also indifferent uh, to the structure, let's say, unlike CCTV where it's telegraphed. If we did that, we wouldn't offer anything to, let's say, the world of uh, skin design. There's the view from, uh, from the water. This is in Yichang, uh, a provincial city in China. Uh, we got a commission uh, to build uh, a big building at the corner of this kind of uh, central park. It's near the Three Gorges Dam in, in uh, the Hubei province. Uh, our site uh, is right here, the most prominent site in, in Yichang. Okay, um, uh, this is for Jeff, uh, and this is the Hokusai wave moment. Um, and we can kind of talk about it, and maybe it's water passed under the bridge. Um, when you present to the client, and, and, and Alejandro uh, uh, already articulated this in his famous story with the uh, um, port terminal, they didn't know what they were doing. And in this case, the client asked for uh, one thing, which is we have a 150-meter tall tower, 
And we want the rest of the program to be kind of in discrete objects, meaning we didn't want a tower and then a kind of a network urbanism project below, let's say, that, that maybe somebody like Hadid might do. So we had to think about the nature of the tower and the vertical and the fact that uh, this city produces more uh, steel ship construction than any other city in China. So we dared to say that these buildings were vessels and we dared to make this image and put it on the site because this is the design. And I'm also sorry to say that all we had to do was show them that and then make that and the discussion was over. Uh, after that, uh, we had a kind of carte blanche and I'll just leave that part at that and then talk about the specific issues uh, that are going on. 150 meter tall tower is actually still a fairly stubby form. It's not some uh, beautiful, elegant thing. We took one form bilaterally symmetrical. We laid it horizontally. Uh, we made a small one vertically and we made it the bigger one uh, here. I'm sparing you images of uh, European painters who paint still lifes. If you look at Rembrandt or Van Gogh, you're going to see a couple of bottles, you're going to see a loaf of bread, and there's always a horizontal piece, and there's always two or three things that are tall. I didn't show those because they have no reference to, you know, an, a, an Asian culture, but even that became curious for us. That's why we call this still life urbanism. We wanted essentially these buildings to take on as much of a kind of curious life, even though I think at the end of the day they're pretty stoic, that the way in which people would move around them and apprehend them would be possibly like old school modernism. You make a plinth, you make a plaza, and you put o objects on it as opposed to really manipulating the base like we did in Keelung. This is a different sort of project altogether. Um, Hotel, office, uh, shopping, concourses, mixed-use project uh, as typical. And, you know, in making these, these images in this particular way, and we isolate them with no people and no scale and so forth, we want to drive the scalelessness on the one hand and, you know, continue some of the conversations about uh, product design or scalability. And, you know, you can see the... You can see the floors in here. You can see that this uh, prefabricated uh, skin is different than these guys. And uh, there's, the, uh, there's the main site plan, super, super simple. There's a shopping mall below all of this. These are skylights down into the shopping and the two office buildings with center court. The tall building has got a void injected into it, and so this is essentially like what you typically do with a, with a tower. If you take, say, Tom Main's far tower, which is big at the bottom and, and gets smaller uh, at the top, that's, of course, because the atrium in that building you know, was at the bottom and all these pieces accumulating into it. Really brilliant uh, project. To smaller floor plate at the top, we turned it over because they asked for the hotel to be at the top and we decided to inject an air at the top of the building, which of course gives it the asymmetry uh, that you see. We had to discipline the project. You can see a diamond grid behind because we've got structure running this way and structure running that way. And after we did the first schemes where we did skins that had a diamond grid on it, we again, you know, like all architects, we became sad and said this is not going to offer anything to uh, skin design and we had to turn to some other tricks to be able to uh, uh, push that in a different direction. So it's a super rigorous uh, thing. It's, a, it's one uh, prefabricated component, um, two stories flipped upside down to be able to make this kind of razzle-dazzle uh, razzle skin. So we think at the, at the level of at least introducing a project which very, very much distorts the way, literally distorts the way in which you read its form because of the kind of uh, patching together of the spirals. These are just another striped project with a bunch of seams that uh, uh, make you read the project differently. Uh, the High Line, I won't go through it too much. Hopefully you've seen the project and just tell you that this, too, is a funhouse mirror project in many, many ways. It, 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 not a building that, that uh, represents uh, uh, what, what life has typically been like in New York, which is build X amount of floor plate within a proper field. 
the mirror being held up you know, to the world. Our client gave us the fun house mirror and said, you've got to make a, a project that's actually distorted bigger than what the site will allow. We took it on as a dare and ended up um, somehow making it. it it's uh, already 40% of the building is illegal uh, because the width of the building as allowed by the site was 25 <laughs> feet wide. This is 32 feet and it cantilevers out in public space. It's the only building with private space in public space. Uh, the Whitney is in private space. Uh, uh, the blue building by Bernard cantilevers over private space. And that wasn't our ambition. It's just another little telltale sign of, you know, you could say, well, we're pushing the reality of, of what would be possible in this particular moment or site. We have a captive audience. Uh, she's got a camera and taking pictures of whomever, and she's probably going to walk up and get the picture of the, of the offbeat building. And we know that whether they're taking pictures of it or not, we've got a, an audience that's almost like on a thrill ride. Um, it's not a random world. They're on a thrill ride. And um, our job is to essentially provide a certain amount of, uh, 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 let's say, captivation um, for that audience, which is uh, governed and, and, and uh, uh, controlled uh, in a way. The client asked for a glass building on the front, uh, the south and the north, and an opaque building on the side, imagining tall buildings will come in in the future, and we obliged uh, uh, by that. And even these context images begin to show you, well, here's the history of the last 25 or 30 years in Chelsea, you know, of what was being built. This is 2005, 2006. Global wealth is on the rise. Uh, clients are asking architects to, within uh, projects that are about the commercial world, sort of dance like elephants on one leg, make a project, make it spectacular. We all buy into it. There's uh, Jean Nouvel, Frank Gehry, uh, uh, Richard Meyer down the street, and so forth. So there's this whole, what I call, Roman forum of, of architects making projects for a particular moment in time. Maybe it's the end of aesthetics uh, in, in New York, who knows. But you can literally see that this is almost like a stretched normative building. We want it to look taller than really what it is. It's 15 stories. We take the diagonals and run them through three and four floors, so we make you think that this is a, a weird, perverse, four-story uh, building, uh, sublimating the kind of stratification of the floors behind. And to do that, of course, we have to do something to kind of telegraph the structure onto the project so that no matter when it is, what time of night and day, uh, uh, environmental conditions and so forth, you're going to have that uh, legibility. And the closer you get to the building on the high line, the less, uh, the more you start to see of the, the kind of depth, the further away you get, the only thing you see are these kind of uh, two-dimensional profiles. To make that happen, we go to China and build special prefabricated components, what we learned a lot uh, about construction in China, that gets rid of uh, another spandrel element so we can span from floor to floor and a kind of spandrel uh, beam that holds this whole prefabricated element is um, already involved. 90% of the building was uh, made off-site and just kind of snapped together. The whole skin was made in, in China and in Buenos Aires. Uh, the steel frame was made in, in uh, Montreal and driven down on a truck and kind of put together. Now you can see where the, where the blinds uh, come down. These are all the private bedrooms. These are the private bathrooms. And you know, they're going to pull the, the blinds down at some point. And we want to make sure that the structure is constantly telegraphed onto the uh, project. It's what I call a new contemporary fact work. You know, timber, half timber construction and fact work construction from, from you know, uh, in, in Germany and England and so forth, did you ever see a fact work project where they painted the structure white and the infill white? Nobody ever did a white on white fact work project. It's always a high contrast. Uh, they either paint it with tar or dark brown paint. And somebody decided at some point, this is how we build the building, this is how we put it together, and we'll codify all the parts and pieces just the same. It's a contemporary project in many, many ways and in, in, in the hands of many architects. And we decided instead of putting a cladding in the glass, we just simply wanted to put a decal in the glass. This upset 
all the most uh, conservative, modernist, moral friends that I have. They said, you can't do that. And I said, this is a, this is a program that we gave to the project so that uh, the larger project about how you could read the distortions of the building, both in terms of its structure and also in its form, would constantly play out. And you even get the kind of extra uh, uh, doppelganger of uh, structure. We made all kinds of models. This is Eric Leishman, who's a UCLA grad, works for Greg now. We milled uh, a full-size panel in uh, MDF, sent it to a, a car shop. By the time we went down to Buenos Aires, where this amazing uh, uh, engineer tried to figure out how to really do it, we had all kinds of problems. So reality is also an interesting thing because we sent digital information. It was as precise as we could put it together. By the time it went into the stamping machine and the stainless steel started acting, an, uh, the real reality of the diabolical nature of materials pushed back on us. I had to fly down to Buenos Aires. These are, these are dyes uh, that, that took days and days and days and days uh, on a mill, and, and they said, we need to exaggerate the profile so that when we pull them out of the dye, uh, the stamping machine, it's going to look right. How should we do that? And I walked in and I said, maybe let's do it about like that much. And that was a kind of human intervention that in a way destroyed the promise of what digital technology is. And, and for me, this is me distorting the reality that we trust is embedded in digital uh, information. Right, like numbers don't lie. Like architecture is just all about numbers. Well, it's also about the imaginary. And going down in there to do that was more the imaginary than it was anything else. Here's the way it ends up. Anyway, uh, I hope I haven't gone too long. I really appreciate the, the, the attention. And, and we're all, we all tell truths. We all tell lies. We're all reality distortion field makers. Whatever is out there, we want it to be different. We don't just hold mirrors up to the world. In that case, we don't, we don't, we don't give anything of ourselves. Architecture is about the imaginary, but for us, it has to run through the concrete because I never want you to think that I can't shock you with the real. So thanks very much. Got one somewhere? Students? I have to pay my students to ask questions. Like my elementary school teacher said, if you eat the spinach, I'll buy you a, a you know, a ice cream bar. It was a total con all the time. So uh, I encourage all the teachers to con the students because, uh, yes. Uh, how come the two year reality distortions uh, seems to be just an exterior reading and not an interior experience? Um, <coughs> maybe clarify that a little bit. What, what leads you to that question? It seems like all the interiors are extremely strict and uh, that the focus has been on the skin and that the world or the distortion of the interior world is still pretty normative on the inside of the buildings. Would you say that was the case in the white house that I showed? Oh, I guess not. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just, yeah, I, I think uh, I get your question. I showed a lot of developer projects for which space is not part of the mission meaning they're, they're, they're economic machines, they're not museums and so forth. So I know there's probably a message if you take the high rises in China um, or the office building in, in Beverly Hills that we're, we're not designing any interiors and there's no program to, uh, to push in those projects. And so I think the messages that you get sent that stuff causes you to, even within the, the, the experience of watching the lecture, forget about the house, for instance, because there's a, maybe a preponderance of those things. Uh, 
I could have showed another constellation of images or another constellation of shots maybe that might have sent different signals to you, but um, you know, you can see what you want, but no, the, the world of the interior or the world of the exterior is still the same project, you know, for us. Um, if that didn't come across, it's just because maybe I didn't customize the, the projects to do that. At least that's my, I, that's an honest answer, you know, not trying to avoid anything, so. Yes. Um, I think you want to go with one plan. Um, so I was wondering about your view of representation. Um, you want to capture these in a very realistic realm, such as photography. Um, where do you feel that the, the drawings of architecture are gone, or is that to you just the red and not the blood? Well, um, we, yeah, I, I, it's good that you kind of picked up on that because I might have I might have issued a um, you know a disclaimer and said I'm I'm not showing plans and sections because I don't want to take the time to put you in that mood or explain explain the projects in that way as what might be more typical of uh, architects talking to architects and wanting to see the section and so forth. Um, we th there's tons of there's tons of drawings which which we're doing uh, right now which I think have a have a life and a language and and they'll be in our book and they're going to be as as deep and rich and and uh, provocative as everything even though they still come out of the concrete, um, but they're they're very important you know within our particular culture but it's true I am more interested in spending the hour and ten minutes to talk to you about something outside of, you know, the expected way in which, you know, the tools of representation would be, you know, presented to you. I think, I, I've, I, I have a, f uh, I've always said that I'm more interested in designing than drawing, even though I, 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 at some point became famous for them, but all of that stuff was just part of the 85% that I never got to build. So the fact that they have a life is just a long-standing legacy of, how the, these images, which either get built or don't, also have their kind of own intensity. And I guess I'm just having more uh, interest in exploring the nature of, of uh, the real through, you know, the photographic, um, because it's, it's, you talk about issues of fidelity and, and so forth, than drawing. And I'm also interested in audience. And the images that we make in the office are the ones that I showed you. We don't make special images for clients. Most architects actually do because they hate making renderings because they feel, I say they, uh, just a little bit to oppose. They represent the commercial. They represent uh, um, a capitulation to the uneducated. Uh, they represent the death of mystery. They represent all of these horrible things. And I'm just, I'm totally on the other side of that. And I always have been because I'm super concrete. And architects are concrete, they make their drawings and so forth, but um, I prefer to let the imaginary in our stuff work through the concrete, and if that baffles people because, well, how could it be imaginary, you're being so deadpan about it? That's a lot of what I want to bounce around in your head tonight. And, and I feel like maybe I'm in a small club, uh, I'm not even sure who else is a member of it, except except maybe photographers who don't bear the burden of, you know, going in front of a client and, or even, you know. So I graph that world to, to try to, to, to tell you what kind of context, you know, we think about. And I think it's somewhat unusual, you know, in our field, and that's what I came to kind of share tonight. Yes. Uh, one back. Yes. Uh, let me say three things. One is it's a fantastic idea. Secondly, congratulations on uh, <coughs> I the word I just saw the leapfrogging out of, of what is it was clearly a very short and minor crisis in the hammer. I guess that's what it was long.
Uh... 